This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So John Ferreter is here with us tonight. John is the managing director of Octagon en Entertainment. Excuse me. <clears throat> John was formerly the executive vice president and worldwide head of non-scripted television for a tiny little agency called William Morris, one of the biggest and most prestigious in the world. And he also sat on the board of directors at William Morris. Now John has had his hand in packaging some of the most popular television shows on TV. Biggest Loser, ever heard of it? Project Runway, ever heard of it? How many people watch those two shows? Don't lie. And that's just to name a couple. He's also um, been very involved in, in creating the brand and maintaining the brand of a lot of on-screen celebrities, um, including folks like Ryan Seacrest, Larry King, um, Mario Lopez, Pierce Morgan. It's a long list, lots and lots of folks. He began his career at William Morris in 91, and he started at the ground floor, right? He was an assistant within the television division. He did well, he proved himself, he worked his ass off, and in 93, he was promoted. He became the liaison between the worldwide music group and the television group. Now, this was in 1993. Like any smart, energetic entrepreneur, John had his eyes and ears open, and he saw something interesting happening in the television landscape. And many of the veterans that were standing there right next to him seeing the same events didn't see it. So he started recruiting directors and producers and other folks for what became known as reality TV. So John was truly one of the pioneers in what is now a you know, gazillion dollar business. But John was there at the forefront because he saw the things that were changing within the television industry that would lead to the success of reality TV. Now he's also worked in all the other genres of TV, game shows, um, variety shows, um, scripted television, and even talk shows. But it's reality TV where he really made his mark. Now I'm especially excited to have John here because he started his career here at UCSB and he got his degree in theater. Wrong. Um, arts. Wrong. History. Yeah. <laughs> he got his degree in history. Graduated with honors. Um, and he'll tell you the story of how he went to General Motors right out of college um, and then pursued his passion, his lifelong passion, which he continu continues to pursue, which is music. He toured for several years, was a su successful touring musician. Um, he did that before he joined um, William Morris. And I can tell you to this day, John has been able to build this passion that he has for entertaining, for music, you know, for um, bringing entertainment to a large audience. He's been able to weave that personal passion with his professional career. As recently as August of this year, John performed in front of about 35,000 people in Liverpool uh, with his band. So that's, to me, the secret of happiness. It's great to make a lot of money and, and sort of be successful, but to be able to have a lifelong passion that you can continue to pursue as an adult, yet still be very successful professionally, that's a great recipe for happiness. So John's a busy guy, drove all the way up here from LA, huge chunk out of his day, I appreciate it. Let's show him your appreciation by giving him a hand and welcoming him. Thank you. Um, much appreciated. Are you guys cool? It's okay where I stand? 
I can walk anywhere and this is okay and you can all hear me? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting me to come out. I had to laugh when I walked in here because the first time I ever came in this room was in 1978 and a fraternity was doing a fundraiser in here and it was sold out. I've never seen this room full before because they were uh, raising money showing the film Deep Throat. <coughs> so this is the second time I've been in this room. So uh, I loved coming to Santa Barbara. I came to a journalism conference uh, when I was a junior in high school. They put me up in, I think it was um, Anna Kappa dorm. And when, as soon as you leave the campus on El, El Colegio, that used to all be one field from there to Francisco Torres. There were no buildings. And I remember walking out as a 16-year-old, and all I saw were beautiful women wearing tank tops and dolphin shorts playing Frisbee. And I had just come back from looking at all the schools on the East Coast, and I was like, I'm going here. <laughs> <laughs> I can actually go to the University of California, get a degree, and go here. Fantastic. So, um, and I came up about a, a couple of weekends ago. I have been playing music again with my friends who play in town all the time. They recruited me to come back and play with their band, which I just do for fun. But yeah, we played uh, in August eight shows in Liverpool. We played three at the Cavern where the Beatles were discovered, which was incredible, an incredible experience. And we played one show for 35,000 people and one for 40,000 people out on the street, which was just a rush. As soon as I got off, my phone started ringing from clients saying, where the, f you know, where the hell are you? Um, I was like, I gotta call you back. I'm in Paul McCartney's room. Um, but, but I will tell you something that's, that, that's interesting is I came to UCSB, I graduated in 1982. I was student body vice president. Uh, I was on the ledge council for a couple years. I ran KCSB and did a lot of stuff with the Nexus. And if I ha actually had my stuff together, I would have shown you all these things from what the Nexus looked like from 1978 to 1982 when you would have laughed because it looks exactly the same. <laughs> and when I walked by the office today, I'm pretty sure it's the same people working there. <laughs> I know it's the same people at KCSB, and I guarantee you Saturday night from six to eight, they're still playing the same cassette tape of Red Earth Radio. So if you, you might get your Indian chance and they've had that on for about 40 years. Um, but I, you know, I came here and I had a great time and uh, while I was uh, a senior, we had a scandal with the chancellor here, his name was Robert Hutton back, and it looked like he was absconding with funds. We went after him, he basically said, I can wait you guys out, and the academic senate got him and threw him out about two years later. And I learned a lot at that point, which is all through life you're gonna run into temporary people who make permanent decisions. Don't let them get in your way. When you run into those people and they're the no, 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 can't be done, no, 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 that means no, they can't get it. They can't get it done. So you always have to find out if you're going to be an entrepreneur and if you're going to be successful in sales and all forms of business involve some form of sale, you have to turn a no into a yes. So what I'm gonna try to talk about in, in some senses here with you all is kind of how we've done that through, throughout the years. And the easiest way for me to do it is just to tell you what my journey was. And as I said, if you have questions along the way, raise your hand. If I don't call on you right away, I may just kind of tap you. You can put it down and I'll call on you when we, when we get the break. But I graduated from college and uh, I was really happy and I decided to stay here uh, over the summer. I was playing in a band called the Stingrays at that point. And our friend had just started a band called the Tearaways that, that still plays all the time and they're great. And um, yeah, I was playing and I thought it was great. So I took two jobs over the summer. I was living at 6782 Sabado Tarde. I guarantee you, if you go up in the vent, there's some stuff up there that you'll find. <laughs> but uh, I lived there and I worked at a, it was the first breakfast restaurant that Isla Vista had ever had called The Egghead. And I was working there because my friend owned it. And I was an umpire for Little League and Boys Club games. And it was great until September came. So I was still working there, having a good time. And I was basically chopping up some tomatoes for breakfast on a Saturday morning. And this guy that I couldn't stand, I hated him while I was here, <laughs> basically said, ah, oh, there he is. Look, that guy was vice president. And now he's chopping tomatoes in a kitchen. You know, so you kind of sit there and you go, OK. It shouldn't matter what anybody else thinks. But when it's a complete dwid who you hate, that's kind of a, a motivating factor to say, I need to do something. So I got up and I applied for a real job and I was hired by uh, 
General Motors in town, which was a Delco plant, which was right out on the corner of Stork and, um, and Hollister. And I went and I worked there, and then it was a constant battle because about a year and a half in, um, GM merged with a company called Electronic Data Systems that was run by a guy named Ross Perot. Has anybody heard of him? He's the all-time leading salesman from uh, IBM, started his own company, took out one room in the top of a building in Dallas right next to the airport, but he actually rented the roof and put up three letters, EDS. So every plane coming in and out of Dallas saw EDS, and that's how it became one of the top companies in the world. The good news about it was I said, this is great. I now have a boss who's in Dallas. I'm never going to see him. The bad news was the first day I saw him, and he came in and he said, everybody's got to cut their hair. Your hair's too long. Cut your hair or you're fired. So the next two years was a battle where every time they would come into town, they would pull me into a room and say, you need to cut your hair. Because my hair was about your length at that point. And um, well, you know, as long as you have it, grow it, guys. Trust me. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. OK. <clears throat> so it was a constant battle with that. And then finally, they called me in and they said, look, you're either going to be a GM guy, and you're going to be a corporate guy, and you're going to do what we tell you to do, or you should really leave. And I remember that day, it was in 1986, I think it was, where I looked him in the eye and I said, I am not going to have a job where I have to wear a suit every day. <laughs> so there are things we say when we're young that we don't really mean, um, or that we don't know what we're talking about. But I then went out on the road with my band. And we were on the road. We were recording. We did a couple records. We, you ever heard of a band called Guns N' Roses? We went out and toured with them and did a bunch of shows with them. A band called R.E.M. We went out and did a bunch of shows with them. A band called The Bangles. We did our first show with them actually at Campbell Hall here, which was cool because the singer was hitting it at the time with Prince, so he was sneaking in and out. Um, so Prince has been to this campus, just so you know. And, uh, and I had a great time doing it. And I moved to Los Angeles in, uh, I think it was April 8th of 1988. And I went down and got another job working at a swimming pool store, and then I was recording. And every night I went into the studio, and we were recording singles and demos and playing shows. And I, and I was just having a great time. And um, I remember we came up to play a show up here. And have you ever been, are, uh, are you all here through the summer? Anybody like stay here through the summer at all? OK, so you, you know about Fiesta? So we were, every year, one of the cool things to do as a band, if they, I don't know if they still have it, but they did a stork dance. They did a dance in Stork Plaza. And that was the coolest thing in the world, because you would play that dance, and you would see all the incoming freshman girls, which was really cool. And you'd go, OK, this is a good class. You know, <laughs> This is great. And I'm a singer and a guitar player standing on stage at UCSB. All the ugly girls went to Stanford. The pretty ones came here. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, have, we'd have this great time. And then over the summer, we'd want to play Fiesta, which was in August. The, it's like August 4th, 5th, something like that. So we would always um, you know, play Fiesta and have a great time. And I came up, I think it was 1990, and we were headlining Fiesta. And I was really happy, because they were paying us like five grand. And uh, I'd written about 300 songs, and we were playing all originals, and I thought, this is what I've always wanted to do, which it wasn't, but it was just a passion of mine. And I was like, this is going to be the coolest thing. And when we pulled in and we did our sound check, this van pulls up. It's the opening band. And the, the door is not even affixed to the side of the van. It's like a bungee taped on, or bu uh, uh, bungee cord. And I thought, God, this is really terrible. And anyway, the door pops open, and these guys roll out of the van. and. They start setting up their gear, and I look at the guys, and I go, OK. I'm now 30 years old, and the guy that's in the opening band for us, who's about 42 or 43, was the hottest musician in Santa Barbara when I first came up, and all I wanted to do was be him. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't want to be him. I don't want to be that guy doing this at that point. I don't know what I'm, where I'm going to be health-wise. I don't know where I'm going to be, if I'm going to be married or have kids or any of that stuff. And I thought, OK, I really need to get serious. And I've always been successful enough in terms of what I've done to do whatever I need to. I need to really kind of figure out business. 
So I was dating a girl down in Los Angeles and her, da her, her parents were in the entertainment uh, business and her um, great grandfather was a guy named Louis B. Mayer. Have any of you heard of MGM? Okay, he's the mayor from MGM, which was the biggest studio in the history of Hollywood. All of the stars were at MGM. So every Sunday night, her mom would have a dinner at their house and they would invite, invite people over. So I had, once again, my hair was your length and I was usually wearing like jeans and beetle boots and was kind of doing my rock thing. And I would come in and I would sit with my girlfriend and her mom and her, her brother and they'd always have guests there. So the first night I walked in, <clears throat> there was a little old woman sitting there drinking sherry and I was talking to her about stuff. And she said, uh, she said, you know, I used to be an actress. And I said, oh, that's great, you know, do anything I might have uh, seen or heard. And she said, well, I won an Academy Award for it happened one night. And I went, oh, you're Claudette Colbert, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, and then the next week, uh, a photographer came by and he's showing us all of his pictures and he had done a few films and his name was Roddy McDowell and he brought his friend and her name was Elizabeth Taylor. And then the next week, there was a TV producer and he was getting ready to, or just kicked off a show called Beverly Hills 90210 and his name was Aaron Spelling. And his little daughter Tori and his little son Randy were there. And then the next week was this John Forsyth, who was Charlie from Charlie's Angels. And the next week it was R.J. Wagner from Heart to Heart. And every week there was some other kind of Hollywood legend that was there. And everyone would say, you know, I don't know about your band, but you should probably do something in the entertainment industry. So being a UCSB grad, I immediately jumped to it and I went, yeah, I probably should. And I started investigating the, the uh, entertainment business and I decided that I was, you know, I might work for a record company because I loved music, maybe a management company. And then I started looking at the talent agencies. And when I started looking at the talent agencies, every time I would talk to the friends of the family, they would say, you'd be a great agent. So when I started investigating what it took, I found out you had to have a college degree and then in addition to having a college degree, you had to have at least two years of experience in the company mailroom, and then it could take three to four years to get promoted, depending on what would happen. So I sat there and I went, so that means I'll be 35 if everything's perfect. Okay, my philosophy is gonna be this. I will outwork every person here, and I will do this in record time, or it'll kill me, but I'm, uh, that's what I'm gonna do. So I went and I applied to all the agencies in town and every agency said the same thing. We are never going to hire you. Yes, you have a college degree, but you have no real entertainment experience and your hair's too long. And you look like you're wearing your father's suit. So one of the, uh, a temp, I went to a temp agency and I said, can you guys place me someplace? And they said, we'd love to, but your hair's too long and you look like you're wearing your father's suit. We're not sending you out. So I said, okay, look, I can get a haircut, and I think it's discrimination when you say that to me, and my sister's an attorney, so at the very least, you've gotta give me a typing test. And that was my secret weapon. I'm a guitar player, I type 70 words a minute. So as soon as I walked in and went like that, they said, okay, come in, work here at the temp agency. You'll be here for about six months, we'll find you something. So I came in the next day, um, long before 9-11 and security and all these things that we all go through now, uh, I just walked into the building and said, hey, I work at this place now to the security guard, to the janitor or whatever. I said, can you open the door? And he did. I walked inside. I figured, okay, my first day, I'm gonna make a coffee. I'm sure I'm gonna have to do that at some point. So I found the coffee machine, started making it, and the phone rang. So I answered the phone, and the woman says, hi, it's Liza Rivera from the William Morris Agency. We have a really difficult agent who can't keep an assistant and I need the most mature person you have who can deal with difficult people. <laughs> and in one of those how to succeed in business without really trying moments, I was like, his name is John Ferreter and I will send him over right now. <laughs> That was the first job I got for somebody. <laughs> that job lasted 19 and a half years, by the way, before I made a, a switch into what I'm doing now. So I went over there and I looked around and everybody there was somebody. 
their father was someone, they were related to someone, they were all in the entertainment industry, and I didn't really know anyone. I knew my girlfriend and her, her family, and her brother, who was the head of casting for Aaron Spelling, which, by the way, was a great job, because all he did was interview every beautiful girl in town for their shows and, and put them all, you know, he discovered every single one of those, uh, like the hot actresses from the uh, 90s. And he's the only one I knew, and I knew his assistant. And his assistant was a, was a woman named Kim Schimmel, and her husband did something in the music business. So when I got my William Morris interview, and this is really important for all of you to remember, because now there's a word that exists now that didn't exist when I came up, which is called networking. And it's so easy for you to do it now because you've got Facebook, Twitter, MySpace. If you're, if you're not into banjo, start looking into banjo. You will be, okay? That's the next thing coming up. Um, but you're gonna be in all these different things. There is no excuse for you to not stay in touch with your peers. And just so you all know, this is your peer group. There are about 105, 106 people in this room, including the crew. This is your peer group. And you should be staying in touch with everyone and helping everybody as you go along. Because trust me, when you're 50 years old and your life starts to change, somebody in this room is going to help you. I'm telling you that right now. And I'll get to that in a second. So when I went into William Morris, I walked in. Human Resources loved me. They put me in the room with this guy. His name was, was Richard Howard, and he went by the name Dick. So it was Dick Howard. So I thought it was like he's the Dick Coward when I first met the guy. So I walk in, and I'm looking at him and trying to get a sense. The first thing he said to me was, who do you know in the entertainment industry? If I'm going to make a call right now, who can I call who can vouch for you that it's worth me hiring you and giving you a job? And I said, well, I know Tony Shepard. And he goes, I don't know Tony Shepard. And I thought, the only other person I knew who was really in the entertainment industry was Kim Schimmel's husband. And his name was Mark Schimmel, and he was a manager or something. And I said, and I know Mark Schimmel. And Dick Howard looked at me and he said, you know Mark Schimmel? All right. He picks up his phone and he calls Mark Schimmel. So I'm thinking, I'm out of here in 60 seconds, and I am never coming back in this. And he picks up the phone and he says, Mark. It's your cousin, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, all right. And he goes, I'm sitting with this guy, John Ferreter. I'm thinking of making him my assistant. Should I do it? And, Mar and Mark Schimmel said, you absolutely should do it. You should hire him. He's hungry as hell. He's smart. And he will make your life easier. I'll see you Sunday. Hung up the phone, and I got the job. Mark Schimmel, to this day, is the COO of Epic Records. He's L.A. Reid's partner. Okay, so he's doing pretty well. And he could have said, I, I don't know who he is, or I think he's dating the sister of the guy that my wife works for. He could have said anything else, but the fact that he said, yes, hire him, that's how I got that job. So as we talked about at the very beginning, when I kind of started on the career, um, most people as assistants, and all of you as you graduate, if you get into some of these businesses, before you start up your own. And you may start up your own. They may be successful. You may start them and they may fail. But at some point, you're going to be answering somebody's phone and getting their coffee and getting their laundry. OK, you all know that, right? OK. Everybody has done it. Steven Spielberg did that. Jeffrey Katzenberg did that. David Geffen did that. George Clooney did that. Everybody did that. So suck it up when somebody says, there's not enough milk in this. What I had to do, I, see, I was lucky. I didn't just have to do that. My boss told me on the first day that he was starting a new thing called dialysis, which meant two to three days a week he had to be at a dialysis center. The rest of the time he would come in and do self-dialysis in the office that they were just experimenting with, which meant I had to smuggle a pole into the office, a medical pole, and he would literally put the fluid in and take the urine out. So in addition to doing everything I had to do and answering the phone, getting the coffee, scheduling everything, I got to smuggle out two bags of urine every other day. OK, so you do what you need to do to get done what you need to get done. And I just said, hey, if this is what I have to do, you know what? I'm going to be the best urine carrier there is in the entertainment business. And as you start working with bigger stars, you're carrying out worse things, trust me. There's the old, there's the old, uh, the old line, a friend will help you move, a good friend will help you move a body. Welcome to Hollywood. 
So when I started at William Morris, and, and I, I actually was promoted in record time. I was promoted two years to the day that I started. And I was excited. I was now an agent. Uh, my starting salary when I went in there in uh, 1991 was $18,000 a year. My salary the second year was $18,800. I made it work. When I got promoted, they paid me $28,000 a year. That's what I was getting. So I decided I need to accelerate my career since I started at the age of you know, 30, 31, coming into this, and everybody else started when they were 22. So what I did was I said, I'm going to go do something, something big. So I looked everywhere I could, and I found two names. And I said, these people don't have agents. I'm just going to go sign them. And then people will have to deal with me. So I picked up a cover of Vanity Fair, and the it girl at that moment was a guest model named Claudia Schiffer. I basically tracked down her attorney, because I knew every straight guy in the world wanted to sleep with her, and every gay guy wanted to dress her. And they were all in Hollywood. So I tracked down the attorney, found out she had no representation. And I went down to a show, which was the hottest show on TV. It was the hottest show on late night, called The Arsenio Hall Show. Do you all know who Arsenio Hall is? Do you? Show of hands if you know who Arsenio Hall is. OK, we're going to talk about that in a second, too. So I talked my way onto the set. And I met uh, Claudia. And three of Arsenio's friends were hitting, hitting on her in the dressing room. And she wanted them to leave. And I just walked in, and I said, hi. I'm John, I represent Claudia, you guys all need to leave. And they all got up and left. And then I turned to her and I said, oh, you're beautiful. I, 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 I just, I'm, just, I'm just a stalker. No, but I, I literally walked in and I said, I'm John Farragher, I'm an agent at the William Morris Agency and I should be your agent. Talked for 15 minutes, she signed with me. Two days later, I was talking to my sister, who's an attorney up in the Bay Area, she was a brand new attorney. And I asked her how work was going and you know, how were things and what's going on up there. And she said, it's OK, but you know, this weird guy comes in twice a week. He sits in a conference room. He signs all this stuff. And he's just a weird guy. And I said, well, what do you mean he's a weird guy? She goes, I don't know. He's just weird. He drives this big BMW, and he cruises in, and he comes in through the back, and he signs his artwork, and he does all this stuff. I don't know. He just creeps me out. And I said, well, what's his name? Uh, Jerome. And I said, Jerome what? She goes, Jerome John Garcia. And I said, fucking A, Pat, that's Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead. <laughs> you guys represent Jerry Garcia? And she goes, well, I, I guess we do his tax accounting and his estate planning. And I was like, put him on the phone. <laughs> so she hands him the phone, and Jerry gets on, and I talked to him for like 15 minutes. And I said, do you have an agent? And he said, no. And I said, OK, um, what are you doing tomorrow? And he said, well, I, I got to come back in and sign some artwork. And you know, then I'm going to go shoot heroin. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> so I was like, could I please come up and meet with you tomorrow? I'm going to be there. And he goes, that's great. Come on in. You can meet me. Bear in mind, I'd just gotten promoted. So I had gone from 18800 which somebody here can do the math for me. It wasn't a lot on a paycheck. So I didn't really have any money. And I'd been promoted within the month before. So I took what I had. I got a ticket on Southwest. I flew into Oakland Airport. I rented a car. I drove into the office, and I signed Jerry Garcia. I had no plans whatsoever to be in the Bay Area. I had no plans to be in the office. And yes, I lied, because I really wasn't going to be there, and I went up to see him. But here's the point. The phone isn't going to ring for you. You're going to make the phone ring, and that's how you make your career take off. Yes? I am a graduate of the University of California of Santa Barbara. You know what? Hot damn. Here's, here, here's, here's where the, your competitive advantage comes from. Passion. You have to be so passionate on what you're doing that nobody's going to outwork you. Nobody's going to outthink you. You're going to have the right strategy. And if you don't have the right strategy, your partner's going to have the right strategy. And you're bringing your partner in. People respond to passion. That's what they respond to. If you're, you know, I, I always look at it this way. We, we live in a different generation. So if I was here before, if I was here 30 years ago, a professor would be sitting here and he would say, you know, get off your phone and don't do that. And, you know, you're doing some study thing on here that you're doing and your high score is this. Everyone's doing these different things and they'd freak out over it. It doesn't work that way anymore. 
We live in a world where you can watch TV, be on the computer, be on the phone. You can do like 90 different things. You just have to show people that you pay attention to them, that you care about them, that you look them in the eye, that you're passionate about them, you're passionate about becoming their partner, and then you have to do the job. And if you do the job, they're going to stay with you. If you don't do the job, they're going to go, that guy was a jerk off. He sold me a bill of goods. He didn't do anything. But that's the competitive advantage comes from the fact that I hate to lose. By the way, if anybody needs uh, football season tickets, for, no, just kidding. <laughs> Long standing joke here. So, um, but, but that's where it really comes from. So once I had Jerry Garcia and I had Claudia Schiffer, now I wasn't just John Ferreter, who I think is a new agent over at the William Morris Agency. I would call people up and I would say, yeah, it's John Ferreter calling for Michael Eisner, you know, who was the chairman at Disney at the time. Uh, what are you calling about? Oh, uh, yeah, I represent Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead and Claudia Schiffer. If you could have him give me a call when he gets a chance. And then people call back. And I might be saying, hey, can we do a new version of the Mickey Mouse Club, you know, which they own? But it's a matter of getting them on the phone. Here's, here's the most important rule that I, that I realized early on, and I said, I, I will subscribe to this no matter what. Everybody is talking to somebody. They may not be talking to you, but they're talking to somebody during the day. Everybody is. They're on the phone talking to someone. They're having breakfast with someone. They're working out with someone. They're having lunch with someone. They're having drinks with someone. They're having dinner with someone. Since you know that they do that, you just have to figure out how you get in their rotation. They're talking to someone. They might as well be talking to you. And the first time you talk to them, don't waste their time. That's the most important thing. There will not be a second time if you waste their time. If you don't waste their time, there will be a second time. So that was, my, that was my philosophy. My philosophy was figure out how I, I can make myself or my clients matter in their life. So after I had those two clients, then I basically you know, said, hey, I'm going to go sign big actors. So I started calling all the big actors. None of them were going to sign with me. So then I said, you know what? I'm going to go sign all the big newscasters, because they all need agents. And I, signed, I started calling all the newscasters, and none of them would sign with me, because they all had their, their representatives, and they had no interest. So then I sat there, and I thought, what, did I, what, what else did I learn at UCSB? I spent four years working at KCSB. I was the program director for two years. I worked for a local station called KTMS uh, as well that was commercial. I know radio pretty well. And what do I know about radio and radio personalities? You don't see radio personalities on TV. You hear their voice. And I learned after hanging out with radio people, because I had been involved in starting a station in high school called KSPB, up at a school called the Robert Louis Stevenson School in Pebble Beach. And I had worked for a station up there shortly called KIDD in Monterey. And I knew one thing. Television is like cocaine to radio personalities. What? They see me, and I get paid, and I only have to work a half hour and not an eight hour shift? So what I did is I said, I'm going to build my business in a different way. So I called every single radio personality I could find, anyone I had heard of that I thought was good. And I said, let me be your agent. You don't have to pay me on your radio deal, but if I get you TV, I get all of your business. Okay. So we then had a pretty good run. Do you guys know who Dr. Drew is? From Loveline, Dr. Drew Pinsky from Celebrity Rehab, from Rehab, 9 o'clock on HLN, Life Changers, been a client of mine for 21 years. I signed him. You all know of a guy named Carson Daly? I found Carson Daly painting his fingernails in the middle of the night at a station called K-Rock making $30,000. And I signed him. And I convinced MTV to put him on a thing called the Summer Beach House. Then I convinced them to put him into an idea they had as a countdown show called Total Request Live, TRL. Have you all heard of a guy named Jimmy Kimmel? Jimmy Kimmel was a guy who was doing some radio for K-Rock in the morning. He was called Jimmy the Sports Guy. I took Jimmy, signed him, put him into a presentation, then took the tape of the presentation. It was a piece of crap that was never going to air. And I took that tape, and I convinced a guy at Disney to hire him for a show called Win Ben Stein's Money. Ever hear of that show? All right, Jimmy won an Emmy for it. I then took it, and I said, look, you got to give me an idea for something. Jimmy is, how do you say this in the nicest way? But he's really funny, and he's really good at what he does. And I knew he was really funny, so I had to find something to put him in where he could be really funny. So Jimmy sends an email to me one night, over to his manager and to me, and he says, I have an idea for a daytime talk show. It's a show for men, by men, about men, called The Man, Man show. show. Yeah, I saw 
So then I called Jimmy and I said, this is a great idea, but it is never going to work in daytime. And he said, you're an idiot. Everyone's going to watch it. And I said, no, men are going to watch it. Women are going to be disgusted by it, but they're going to watch it with one eye open. You can't do it five days a week. And the economics of doing daytime TV necessitates that you be able to strip the shows across five days. And I said, and it's a comedy show. So let's do it in the tradition of all the great comedy shows that have been out there, and we'll do it at night. So I had, I had just signed a, his, a friend of his named Adam Carolla. And I took Adam and Jimmy, and we sold the man show. 130 episodes, made everybody rich, made both those guys stars. Then I signed uh, a DJ from K-Rock named Kennedy. And then I signed uh, two big DJs from LA. One's name was Valentine, who's still on the air down there, and a guy named Jojo Wright, who's one of the uh, primetime guys they have. Signed a few other people. And then I sold a show called the Radio Music Awards. In the first Radio Music Awards we did, I put three of my clients into it. One I had just found in Canada, and I brought him down. We put a show on MTV. Within five weeks, it was the hottest show uh, in America. His name was Tom Green, who to this day is still a very good friend. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, unlike Jimmy. And, um, <laughs> and with Tom, I took Tom, a client of mine named Mark McGrath, who was in a band called Sugar Ray, and another client of mine who was the biggest musician in the world, Sands One, named Garth Brooks, and I put him onto that show to host the show. And while we were doing the show, there was a guy doing interviews backstage. Everybody that came off who won an award, this guy would jump out with a microphone, and he had frosted hair, and it was like the jack-in-the-box jumping out. How do you feel about winning your award? And then he would go back. And I kept looking at him, and I thought, I gotta talk to this guy, because his energy is good. He's all over the place, but his energy is good. So as the business works, about a week later, Carson Daly started dating a girl named Tara Reed. She was doing a movie called American Pie. Tara, who I'd never met, told Carson, you should fire your agent and be with my agent. Carson, with the uh, character, stamina, balls of steel, caved like a house of cards, fired me the next day, got engaged to her, broke up a week later. And I had built a whole template that I was going to do with Carson. I was going to make Carson the next Dick Clark. By this point, I had had enough success. I had signed Dick Clark, who was like the all-time host on TV. And, and Dick and his family had become personal friends and really good clients. We were selling shows left and right. So I had the template created. Now I didn't have Carson. And, I, and the template involved taking a person and combining their radio assets with their TV assets, putting them into some TV show that everybody would have to watch, and then build a production company out of it like Dick did, and try to take someone and turn them into like a, a eight, nine figure you know, client. Anytime you have a seven figure client, you're very happy. That means they're making seven figures. As an agent or manager, you're making at least six figures. You have an eight figure client, you're doing pretty well with them. You have a nine figure client, you're in the upper echelon. So I looked at this kid who had great energy but was all over the place, and I called him up and I said, and this goes to the competitive advantage, I said, look, you're really good at what you do, but your career is just crap. You have no guidance, you don't know what you're doing. So I'm gonna do two signing meetings tomorrow. One's gonna be at 10 o'clock, one's gonna be at 11. Which one do you want? I was like, 11. I said, okay. You know what? I would have taken any time. I needed to get the guy in the room. But I knew the moment I said that, he realized his career was crap and he needed somebody with balls to come in and say, we're gonna, we're gonna drive your career in this direction. So the next day, the kid walked in and his hair was all frosted and he was doing this stuff. And I said, get rid of the frosted hair. And I, I said, I, I don't know what you're trying to do, but you have the reputation that you'll go to the opening of an envelope. No. <coughs> You have to do something special. You have to be perceived as special. Your energy is great. Your DJ skills are pretty good. Your MC you know, stuff is pretty good. You have an inherent, you have a clock inside here you can do live. So we need to do something that's live with you. So I signed him that day. His name is Ryan Seacrest. I called every buyer he worked for and I said, he's not coming back. He's not going to go on extra for $50 every weekend. He's not going to go on entertainment tonight for $50 every two weeks. He's not going to do a hidden camera show on TNN that doesn't exist anymore. And I pissed off everybody in town. And then I said, you wait until I tell you we have the right show, and then you do it. So about three, four months later, I got a call from a friend of mine in England. And at this point, I had sold a show called Pop Stars. Does anybody remember Pop Stars? We sold it in uh, 2000. It was on the WB. 
it was a hit. We basically took, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand people, tried out for a band. We created a girl band. Five women came together. They were called Eden's Crush. We found the singer from a place in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. She was great. Her name was Nicole Scherzinger. She uh, later moved into the Pussycat Dolls that I worked with later on and then became Nicole Scherzinger. And um, most recently was just doing X Factor here. But the show hit. So while that show hit in the US and became pretty big, they then did a version of it over in the, in the UK. And it, it hit, it became, became a big show over there. And when they put together the judges on these shows, they decided that they wanted to get this, uh, this judge who was a record company exec who was kind of, you know, kind of a pissy guy named Simon Cowell. So they went to Simon Cowell in England. They said, we want to make you the judge, and you can be the mean judge. This was on, on um, pop stars over in the UK. And Simon said, I'm not doing a TV show. I'm a record company executive. Why would I do this? It's beneath me. Forget it. So he turned it down. So they hired another guy and said, we wanted to get Simon Cowell to do this, but he didn't want to do it. Can you be mean? And the guy said, yeah, I'll be mean. I'm happy to do it. I'll be the judge. So the guy who took his place was a guy named, they called him Nasty Nigel. His name was Nigel Lithgow. <laughs> Anybody watch So You Think You Can Dance? Okay. So Nigel Lithgow was an unknown in England in 2000 who did the first version of, of uh, Pop Stars over there. So the show goes on the air and it hits. Simon Cowell's watching it at home and says, I made the biggest mistake of my life by turning this down. While he's watching it, his phone rings, and a guy named Simon Fuller, who had worked with a band called the Spice Girls that I, that I worked with here and sold all their stuff here in the States, Simon said, are you watching the show? And Simon said, I'm watching the show. And he said, Simon, what do you think about it? And he said, well, Simon, I think that uh, this could be done better. And Simon said, I have a better idea for it. And Simon said, what's your better idea, Simon? So Simon said, what if we just find one person instead of a band? Because it's confusing with all these people. Let's just get one star. So Simon said, yeah, let's go do that. Let's find one. So then Simon said, here's what we'll do. Simon, you know records. Si I'm Simon, and I know TV. So I'll keep the TV rights. You keep the record rights. OK, let's go do it. Big lawsuit later. You can read all about it based on that one phone call. So Simon Cowell then got into a new show called Pop Idol. Went on the air, blew pop stars away. I get a call from England. Someone says, I'm watching the show. It's doing a 73 share in the UK. That means 73% of the available audience that can be watching TV at that time is watching that show. Find it and get involved with it. My friends at Fox bought the show. They didn't really want it. Everybody in the US had passed on it, but they bought it because Coca-Cola said, we'll just give you the money for production, and we'll run it over the summer, and it'll be fine. We'll do it once. We'll see what happens. It'll be a good promotion for new Coke or something like that. So they, they basically do this thing. They're getting ready to launch the show. And I look at Ryan, and I go, that's the show. That's the show you're going to host. That's the show that will make you a star. So my closest friend in the entertainment business at that point, a guy named Mike Darnell, who's kind of a genius at Fox who creates, you know, who wants to marry a multimillionaire, which I sold him, all these different things. The guy's a genius. He's about this tall. He's like four foot nine. It, but he's a true genius in the TV business. And he was my closest friend. So this was easy, right? My closest friend, Ryan Seacrest. He's perfect for this, right? Hey, Mike, it's John. How are you? Good. Hey, look, you have a host yet for that show? And he goes, well, we're going to have two hosts. And we've hired one guy. He's a stand-up comedian. He's great. And I said, great. So you've got room for another host? He goes, yeah, who do you got? And I go, I've got Ryan Seacrest. And he goes, the kid with the frosted hair? No fucking way, and hangs up the phone. <laughs> So I called the producer of the show, who I know, and I said, where are you on the host front? And they said, well, we've got this one kid named Brian Dunkelman, and there's another th guy we're looking at named Mike Richards. We think we're going to put him in. I go, stop. Don't do a deal with him until I call you back. So I call Mike Darnell up again. It's about 1230. And a dirty little secret in the entertainment business is from 1 to 2, everybody takes lunch. So it's impossible to get anybody on the phone in Hollywood from 1 to Basically, from 12.45 to 2.15, uh, you can't get them. They're having lunch somewhere. So I call over to Mike Darnell, and I said, Mike, I need to talk to you about Ryan. And he says, the next sound you're going to hear is the emptiness in your head. And he hangs up the phone. <laughs> so I went, all right, this is not going to be as easy as I thought, but 
we'll get it done. Because what do you learn when you're an entrepreneur? No is not an option. No is not an option. If you want to get something done, get it done. Avoid temporary people who make permanent decisions, and no is not an option. So I called over to Mike's assistant, and I said, do you still like red wine? She goes, I love red wine. I said, great. Get me a drive-on on the Fox lot. I need to come out and do something. She goes, OK. I grabbed a bottle of red wine. I drove over, went past security, parked, went up to the fourth floor, walked into Mike's office, sat in his desk, put my feet up on his desk, and I waited for him to come back. Unbeknownst to me, Mike was taking his wife out to lunch that day. They took two and a half hours. He finally comes walking in around 4 o'clock. I am sitting in his chair with my feet up on his desk. And he looks at me and he goes, do we have a meeting? And I said, nope, we don't have a meeting. I said, but we somehow got cut off in the last conversation. <laughs> AT&T. And I said, um, but you're about to make a huge mistake. And because we're friends, I can't let you make that mistake. You're going to launch a show that has 10 live episodes with two people who've never done live TV. What are you going to do when the prompter goes down? What are you going to do when those hosts are up there and they're reading a prompter and they're looking at the thing and it goes down? You have two people who have never worked together, ever. Neither have done live TV. Rupert Murdoch's going to watch it and he's going to fire you, Mike. Rupert Murdoch's going to call you up and say, Mike, you should have had someone who's done live TV before, somebody who knows how to do live. You didn't do it. They failed on the air and you're fired. And I scared the shit out of Mike Darnell. And I said, you need to hire Ryan Seacrest. He does three hours of radio every day. He can count anything down. You got the other guy who you, know, you apparently like. Put Ryan in and let's see what happens. What do you have to lose? Because you're going to lose your job when the prompter goes down if you don't do it. And based on that fear, they auditioned Ryan that day. He got the job. At the time that I signed Ryan and put him into that job, he was making about $250,000 a year in his radio gig, which was pretty good. He now makes $45 million a year, based on what we set up that day. No is not an option. If you want to get something done, and somebody says no, your job is to turn the no into a yes. It's that simple. And if you can do it, if you have that skill, if you have that belief in yourself, you'll be able to do it. Not every time. It does not work with women, guys. Um, <laughs> but it can work in business. And you have to always be able to justify while you're doing it. And understand what everybody's motivation is at the, at the table. So if you do your research, everybody has an agenda. You know what it is. You know how to, how to play that. Anyway, I, I tell you a lot of stuff about, about you know, some of these things and career-wise how a lot of this stuff worked. You know, and what ultimately happened, and which was part of a, actually a really, really sweet introduction, because normally people say, this is John Ferreter. He sold over 300 shows. He, you know, he's been involved in reality TV and the creation of all this stuff. And then I have to walk in and say, yeah, I sell most of the crap you guys watch. <laughs> because a lot of it really is bad. And part of your job as an agent is to get the buyer to buy it. They say, sell it, don't smell it. You know, you're not in charge of, the, of whatever the taste is. You just have to, you know, it's commerce and you have to do it. After 19 and a half years of doing this, I had two things happen in my life which really kind of changed who I am and uh, kind of what happened. I was uh, co-running the TV department. We were, you know, I, I had sold, I was involved in selling Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I sold Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire? I sold a show called The Swan, Biggest Loser, Project Runway, Weakest Link, Greed a game show called Lingo, On Air with Ryan Seacrest, Donnie and Marie. I sold seven or eight Garth Brooks specials. I sold specials with Whitney Houston, Spice Girls, Hanson, The Oak Ridge Boys, uh, Brooks and Dunn. Go through most of the pop acts I was involved in, in all those things. I'd been involved with TRL, American Idol, America's Got Talent. Um, God, just almost anything that you've watched that's out there, Dancing with the Stars, whatever. We were involved in packaging, selling, or representing the people that did it. I sold all the pageants, Miss Universe, Miss USA, Miss Teen USA, Miss America, um, all of those different things. So our sales record in terms of the shows was great. We had a great business. 
our business was going so well that a couple of the guys who were on the board with me at William Morris decided they could take millions of dollars out of the company if they did a merger. And unbeknownst to several of us on the board, they set up the structure for a merger with another company called Endeavor. So when we had to vote on this, and I read all the merger documents, I realized that about 250 to 300 of my friends were going to get laid off. So even though I was going to be taken care of, because uh, I had a great job and a brand new contract, I just said, I, I kind of think this is wrong. William Morris Agency was founded in 1898, oldest agency in the world, the most venerable agency in the world. And I can't believe our founders would want to do this and lay off these people. They'd always taken care of everyone. And I felt bad because it looked to me like people were really self-dealing and were taking money. And the history of the company, what attracted me to William Morris, this won't be as popular to say here, but I always looked at them, it's like in baseball, they were kind of like the Yankees. It was like a storied franchise. And I thought, you know, we kind of have to keep the tradition alive here. Interesting stories about the guy who started the agency and the whole talent business was his first clients were like jugglers and clowns and vaudevillians. And he got involved in doing deals for them in uh, New York in 1898. In and I'll get this wrong, but you guys will probably know. I think it was 1912, April 14th, I think. Um, he was on a boat. And the boat was getting ready to leave, I think, Southampton. And it was coming to the States. It was its maiden run. Built by the White Star Corporation up in uh, Liverpool and in uh, Belfast. And he was on the boat. And somebody came, gave him a little telegram, and said, you need to get off this boat. There is a juggler. This guy does a thing with a dog and a monkey. You got to go see him. You need to sign him. There's money there. So William Morris got off the Titanic and went to see the Variety Act. April 15th, 1912, the Titanic hit an iceberg. Actually, hit an iceberg at about around midnight on April 14th and sunk in the uh, wee hours of April 15th. Coincidentally, my birthday, April 15th. Um, he got off the boat. A couple years later, he was on another boat, and the same thing happened got a cable, you got to get off, and he got off the boat, and it was the SS Lusitana. So if he wasn't passionate about his work, there is no William Morris agency, and who knows what happens with the talent agency business. But a couple years ago, when I realized, hey, this merger doesn't seem right, we uh, voted on the merger, and I was the one guy who voted against it. Subsequently, I realized, OK, my job's probably going to change, because the new guys coming in aren't going to like this. I'm, I'm going to be looked at as the opposition. But something actually intervened. The, the two days after the merger, when we were trying to figure out what we were doing, I uh, checked into Cedars uh, Sinai because I just wasn't feeling good. I had a pain in my leg. And I just thought it was stress, and I pulled a muscle. And I walked in, and the next thing I knew, uh, doctors were running all over the place. And they said, you got a blood clot in your leg, but something else is going on. So this was April 30th, 2009. Sometime on May 1st, 2009, I died. I was dead twice. I flatlined twice, second time for four minutes. When I woke up, <clears throat> I was on a ventilator. It was April 20, or May 21st. It was 20, 20 days later. I had been in a coma. And um, through the grace of God and one good doctor, they said, this guy's too young to let him die. So I suddenly looked from that point on when the doctor said to me, look, you may lose your leg because of the staph. I had a deadly staph infection called MRSA. He said, you may lose your leg, so you may just be walking around with one leg, So that's, you know, but you're going to live. And um, we don't know whether we've contained the MRSA yet. It could come back, and you, you, know, you could go. So when you're in those situations, you reflect a lot on life and on what goes on. And I reflected on a lot of stuff that I learned while I was at UCSB. I reflected on who my true friends and family really were. And I kind of said to myself at that point, you know, if I make it through this, and I don't lose my leg, and I can live a normal life, I'm going to do some things differently. And instead of playing in the fast lane and having, you know, we had 1,000 clients, and we were making gobs and gobs of money, but there was no quality control on what we were doing, I said, if I get another opportunity, I'm going to try to do, take everything I learned, which is good, do the best that I can, still try to make gobs and gobs of money, but do it in a different way. And I'm going to spend time with my friends, my family. And any time I can actually really help someone, I'll open the door to try to do it. You're going to have to walk through that door. But I will help you if I can. You know, you got to be willing to do the work. 
And when I ended up leaving the agency, because there had been a conflict and I came out, I realized after 20 years of being in the talent agency business, I had no clients, I couldn't walk, I had no job, because I had been basically thrown out for voting against the merger. I was gonna have to sue these guys to get my stuff back. And I went, holy shit, I'm 49 years old. What am I gonna do with my life at this point? And after really thinking about it, going, well, I have a life. I actually have a life. So how do I want my life to be? The phone rang. And have any of you guys seen the movie Jerry Maguire? Okay. I lived that. You know that scene with uh, Jerry and Bob Sugar and they're calling all the clients and you're going through it? I actually lived that. I experienced that. That is real. I hate goldfish, but that is real. And having gone through that, I sat there and I thought, this is gonna be the one time in my life where I don't have to try to sell someone, I don't have to try to do any of this stuff. I just gotta see who believes in me. And if nobody believes in me, who knows what I'll do? I, I'd be a barista at Starbucks, which by the way used to be a Taco Bell in Ivy. Um, and I sat there and the phone rang. First call comes in. I pick up the phone. This guy calls me, he's in England. And he goes, I'm reading this stuff online. It says uh, you're out. It says uh, these guys are throwing you out or something. How are you? And I said, well, if I hadn't died three months ago or two and a half months ago, I'd say this is the worst day of my life. But because I've gone through that, I'm doing all right. I'm alive. <laughs> I said, what are you doing up? I said, it's got to be 2 AM in England. He said, well, I woke up and I saw this stuff online, so I wanted to call you and tell you, if this is your Jerry Maguire moment, I am your Rod Tidwell. And whatever happens, I'm going with you because you made a promise to make me a star in America and to take care of my family, and you did it. So whatever you need, I'm your guy, and I will advocate for you. And I said to, to the guy on the phone, I said, look, I got, I got to tell you something. I, none of this is planned. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea what comes next. I, I, I just don't know. And he goes, well, you have one client. I'm your client. He goes, I just sent a note to the agency, sent an email. They're fired. You run with it. Just know I want to get the biggest interview show in the world, and I believe you can get it for me. So the guy who called me at that point was a guy named Piers Morgan. Five months later, I got him the job to replace Larry King. Piers Morgan has the only show that is in all 212 countries in the world. Number one interview show in the entire world. No is not an option. If you want something, you can get it done. You just got to believe in yourself. You got to believe in your product. And if your product's not good, get better product.